welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our special guest author is Dr. Stephen M. Barr, author of Modern Physics and Ancient Faith, published by the University of Notre Dame Press. Welcome, Dr. Barr, to EWTN's Bookmark. Thank you for having Great me. Great to on. have you here. I think uh, you, you're basically new for EWTN viewers, correct? I mean, yes. this would be the first program that I can recall that you've actually been on. Well, I was on uh, a show with uh, Colleen. Uh, okay, Carol so Kim, okay, right. when Col Colleen's Quite a program, while ago. right, right, exactly, okay, but that would have been taped on location. Where yes. was that actually done? That was in there? Philadelphia. Okay, so the first yeah. time is this the first time you've actually been to the EWTN? first time I've been here. Very impressed with. Uh, okay, well, great. Story. We're very impressed with your book, and that's why we wanted you to stop by, and talk to us now. Uh, modern physics and ancient faith. Now, you know, we kind of have done some things. Father Spitzer, who I, right. I know you've done some work with and are well acquainted mm -hmm. with, a good friend of ours, has done some things. We've done a couple of things dealing with science, mm -hmm. and, and there is some interest out there. Why do you think there seems to be a greater concern today about trying to, in a sense, make science and faith work together. Our, 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 our present Holy Father talks about faith and reason. Are right. those related to this? Yes, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's especially important now uh, because there are very aggressive uh, uh, opponents of, of religious belief who, who uh, invoke science, uh, use science as a club to, to, to attack religion. I mean, that's been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm but it seems to have uh, intensified in recent years. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and many people are claiming that there is a conflict between science right. and religion. Let me ask you, uh, you're writing this as a scientist, uh, but also to some degree coming a faith perspective. Right. Uh, now, were you raised Catholic? Yes, I was. Okay, yes. now when did your Catholic faith start to impact your view of physics, or has it always? It always has, I mean, ever since I was a, a little tyke, I've. Uh, uh, been Catholic through and through, but I've also been uh, very scientific, mathematical since I was a kid. Uh, and I never saw any conflict between those. Okay. In fact, I would say both of them, uh, in my view, are, uh, are ways of making sense of the world. That, mm -hmm. That's what the human reason tries to do, is to, to make sense of reality. And, I, and for me, both uh, the Catholic faith and scientific investigation are different ways of making sense of the world. When did you become aware that there maybe was a greater conflict than you realized? <sighs> well, it's hard to say. A lot of the books one I read as a, as a child on science, subtly, you know, uh, there's a spin, a sort of anti-religious spin, and as you get older, you become more and more conscious of that. Uh, though I didn't s myself see any conflict, I became more aware that a lot of people do see a conflict, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and that's why I, I wrote the book, some, uh, because there were not enough scientists who are, there are many scientists who are religious, but not many of them are, are outspoken mm -hmm. or trying to explain to people. Uh, well, and what do you think that is? Do you think that's because if, if people bring their religion to the case, then automatically that's, that's taken away, that say, well, this, is, this isn't really thought through, it's not really scientific, this is just some sort of faith expression, and faith is just based on feelings, in a sense. Well, it's partly, there's a lot of, a lot of factors. Partly it's, it's in, our, in our culture, uh, it's not polite to talk about politics mm -hmm. and religion, so, you know, I've had people in my own physics department that I've been uh, colleagues of for, for 23 years, and I didn't find out that mm -hmm. they were uh, practicing Catholics until a few years ago, right. because people tend to keep it under wraps. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's 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 considered awkward to bring it up. Also, uh, there is some in the, in the academic world, not just science, but in, in the academic world, in the intellectual world, there is a, a certain amount of prejudice against religion. And and why why uh, pick fights if you don't have to? Right. So people play it play it cool. Now I'm talking time. about this this conflict that's out there, yeah. but you're saying that the conflict's a myth. How it's, so? a, it's a complete myth. Uh, well, there, there are different aspects of the conflict. Some uh, people claim that uh, religion, the Catholic Church, uh, religion in general, have tried to suppress science, has been hostile to science, and they mention the Galileo case, for example. They also, there's a, a widespread belief, uh, the, the way this history of science is often told, there's, there's a spin that every great scientific discovery, or many of them, have undercut, have debunked mm -hmm. key beliefs of religion. That's another aspect of the myth. There is a conflict, but it's not between, this is one of my main points, is mm -hmm. th there is a conflict, but it's not between religion and science. It's between religion and a certain ideology, mm -hmm. which is called scientific materialism, a mm -hmm. certain atheistic which philosophy. Which you talk about in the right. beginning of the book. And, and right. to many scientific materialists, uh, 
they, they believe, the, the, the basic tenet of it is that everything is matter. The, the ultimate reality is, is matter governed by the laws of physics. That's it. And they see religion as superstitious. And they see it as part of the calling of the scientist. To, to rid the world of unscientific and irrational ideas, among which they include religion. So you have people like Richard Dawkins, mm -hmm. who see it as part of the higher calling of the scientists to, to eradicate religion. So that, that's what's going on. But it's not science itself. As I say, it's mm -hmm. this ideology that, that wraps itself in the mantle of science. Right, and that's why in your chapter one is really the materialist creed you go through. And you say the debate between religion and materialism has been going on for a long time, mm -hmm. for centuries, in fact. Why then the recent increase in the interest in this subject? Well, let me ask you, when you say how many centuries, so from the beginning of time, has there been this conflict? I think or is it just something that's heated up in the last couple of hundred years? I think it intensified it's in the, during the Enlightenment in the 1700s. Uh, and in the English-speaking world, especially in the 19th century, there were a couple of very influential books, uh, uh, one of them written by the first president of Cornell University. Um, which, which popularized the idea that, that the religion had always been attacking science and, and uh, that they'd been at war. So it's been gr ga gathering steam for, I would say, about 200 years. It, it, it sort of spiked <laughs> recently mm -hmm. uh, for reasons, that, you know, various reasons. It's interesting, though, because you kind of tend to make the point that, you know, if you take a snapshot of science in, let's say, the 1900 period, right. it seems like religion's kind of losing and existence of God's losing. But if you take the snapshot for the 21st century, it seems like God's winning. How so? Well, th that's the thing. The, there were many discoveries up until the 20th century, up until about the year 1900, which many thoughtful people uh, saw as pointing away from the religious view of the world, away from the Jewish and Christian view of the universe, of man, of our place in the world. But as I try to emphasize in the book, and this is not original with me, I'm just bringing this to people's attention, there were many, well, there were quite a few major discoveries in the 20th century, in physics primarily, mm -hmm. which go the other way. I, I call them twists in the plot. Uh, right, many there's of these, five of them. Five of them right. I talk about in the right. book at great right. length. Right. There are major discoveries which actually point back towards a more traditional religious conception of the universe. And, but a lot, that people haven't caught up with that. There's still, I think the people are in a time warp who think that the scientific discoveries are undercutting religion are really seeing things the way they were over a century ago. Is that also because they just want, that's what they believe to begin with? They I kind think, of are doing what right. they claim people who have faith do, right? Yeah, they, 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 they saw a certain trend uh, developing and, and they've just followed that trend and they haven't been able to adjust their thinking. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's largely intellectual prejudice. On well, point. you say here that uh, you point out in this book, and you alluded to it before, I'm going to give my own view of the matter as someone who adheres to a traditional re religion. And you also go to say that I have said that the basic tenet of scientific materialism is that only matter exists. At that right. level, it is a very simple thing. On another level, however, scientific materialism is like religion. You're kind of alluding to that, right? A rather complex phenomenon. Is right. it evolving? Is it changing? Uh, it's complex, I think, because it, it has, there are many factors that feed into it. Um, uh, I don't know that it's changing. I think what people like Richard Dawkins are saying now is indistinguishable from what uh, people like uh, Huxley were saying in the 19th century. Actually, as far as what they're saying, it hasn't changed much. Uh, as I said, they're, they're somewhat stuck in a time warp. Uh, uh, the, the arguments they're making are really rather old hat. Mm -hmm. um, I think it may be changing in the sense that it's getting more popular appeal. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, if you go back 100, 200 years, most people believed that there was a soul, that people had a soul. Uh, now, uh, except maybe some intellectuals uh, who doubted that. Mm -hmm. But now, it's in the popular culture, the idea that we're just machines, that, mm -hmm. that, that computers will someday be developed that can think as well as right. we do, that we'll have uh, they'll be conscious. I mean, this is in all sorts of movies from, you know, The Terminator and so on, right. uh, Star Trek. So the, the, the idea has begun to uh, get, uh, sink into the popular mind that we're really just biological machines. Right, and you talk about in the book our, right. you know, brains, computers, and right. things like that, and you talk about that. But you say that um, actually the recent discoveries, as I talked about before, have actually in certain in important respects damaged the credibility of materialism. Right. Those that relate to 
uh, you'd call the monotheistic religions, of course, of the Bible, Judaism, and Christianity. Right. What would be one of the examples? Now, you talk about the Big Bang Theory is one of the things that certainly the average person watching the show would right. be familiar with. Right. So let's talk about that. Okay. Is that one of them? Yes. Okay. I mean, in, in ancient times, all the, all the Greek philosophers who were not Christian, Plato, Aristotle, they believed the universe had always been here. Uh, in fact, the ancient pagans had ridiculed Jews and Christians because of their belief that the universe had a beginning. Um, in, in the uh, 400 years we've had modern science, uh, there was very little support for the idea of a beginning. Science seemed to, conf seemed to point in the direction that the universe had always been here. Uh, and modern atheists have tended to prefer that view also. The universe has just always been here. Don't ask me why, it's just it's the way it's always been. Mm. Uh, it was not until the 20th century with Einstein's theory of gravity uh, that it became, uh, people began to realize, scientists began to realize the universe did have a beginning. Uh, in fact, the person who proposed the Big Bang Theory was a Catholic priest, mm -hmm. a physicist named uh, Georges Lemaitre. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of resistance among scientists to the idea of the Big Bang because many of them associated that with the religious idea of a beginning, mm -hmm. the beginning. And so that wasn't the only reason, but that was one major reason that it took so long for scientists to accept the Big Bang Theory. But now the evidence is overwhelming. So uh, there's a case where, where the science for, for 300 years seemed to point in, away from religion, that the universe had always been here, and now, lo and behold, it turns out that the best evidence is that the universe did have a uh, beginning. As mm -hmm. Christians had always, Jews and Christians had always mm -hmm. asserted. Well, to touch on, on what you said earlier, uh, and just in that comment, it strikes me, and since this is a Catholic program, right, right. one of the things that's interesting in my reading of several books, and especially this book, the idea you mentioned the Big Bang Theory coming from someone who's a Catholic. Right. But you also point out in this book clearly, uh, in some ways to juxtapose the Galileo affair, right, let's right, say, right. which we can talk a little bit about, the fact of all of these great scientific discoveries having a Catholic connection, right? Right, I mean, this is, this is, I think, one of the great untold stories of scientific history. Very few people who are not specialists know this. But there, there is an incredible array of, of scientists who made important discoveries for the last uh, for more than 400 years who were not only Catholics, but were Catholic priests. Uh, if there are any physicists watching, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll probably be surprised to learn that an extremely important phenomenon in physics called diffraction. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, every, it, it's, it's important in all branches of physics. It was discovered in the 1600s by a Jesuit priest named Francesco Grimaldi. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not in any of the science, in science books you learn that it was discovered in you know, 1800 by Young and Fraunhofer mm -hmm. and these other people, but it was actually discovered by Grimaldi. Mm -hmm. um, for the non-physicists in the crowd, it, those colored bands of light on DVDs and, mm -hmm. when you look, uh, and, and, and CDs, that's a diffraction phenomenon. Okay. So whenever you see those, think of the Father Grimaldi. Uh, one of the founders of modern astrophysics was a priest named uh, Secchi. Everyone knows about Gregor Mendel mm -hmm. as the founder sure. of modern genetics, but there's a list, you know, as long as my arm, of very important right. discoveries made by Catholic priests. Well, it's interesting, too, and sometimes when you read about these people, the fact that they were a Catholic priest is not mentioned. Exactly. There's no, you know, father so and so. Or exactly. A, in know. fact, I was looking over the shoulder of one of my daughters when she was in high school in her biology textbook. It had a whole paragraph on an important biologist of the 1700s named uh, Lorenzo Spallanzani. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I looked at it and I said, Did you know that, that Spallanzani was a Catholic priest? It doesn't mention it in the mm -hmm. science book. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it's, again, it's, a bit, it's an untold story. Well, you know, right in the beginning, uh, in the second uh, uh, chapter, you talk about you, you kind of lay out the materialism as anti-religious mythology. Right. You know, kind of the, their attacks on the church. Right. And um, and one of the things that struck me, you talk about Saint Augustine. Yes. A and you really realize how the church was thinking appropriately, obviously from the beginning. Right. But talk a little bit about Augustine's approach. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to, because Augustine, in, in addition to being a, a, a saint, was a genius. Um, as I said, the, pa the pagans in those days ridiculed the Christians and the Jews for believing that God had created the world of just a finite time ago. Mm -hmm. And what they would say is, what was your God doing for all the infinite time before he got around to creating the world? Was he sitting there twiddling his thumbs? Why did it take him an infinite time before he did anything? And St. Augustine made a very profound answer. He said, 
that the beginning of, of, the, of the world was also the beginning of time. There was no, it, there was no time okay. before the world was created because time itself began with the creation of the world. Uh, so as he said, don't ask what God was doing then. There was no then where there was no time. And that's a very hard idea to wrap your mind around, but physics caught up to that in the 20th century because when Einstein's theory of gravity came along and it became clear that there was a beginning to the universe, in, in Einstein's theory, the beginning of the universe is the beginning of time. It's a vindication of St. Augustine's very profound insight. You, you ask, what, there's no such thing as before the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. This is very hard for people to grasp, but St. Augustine grasped it. So there was no such thing as before the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, so impressed are modern physicists by the, the depth of Augustine's insight that, uh, as Steven Weinberg pointed out in one of his papers, he, in a footnote, he said, it's become a custom uh, in papers on quantum cosmology and technical papers on quantum cosmology to quote from St. Augustine's Confessions, mm. uh, because he, his insight, philosophical insights into the nature of time was so far in advance of his day. You also talk about, and you, you kind of uh, dealing with the, the church's position, uh, and you talk about the idea of dogma, mm -hmm. and you say, the view of dogma as anti-rational is based on a fundamental misunderstanding of what religious dogmas are. What right. do you mean? Right. Dogma is not the idea that many people think that religion says that the world's irrational, mm -hmm. that it doesn't make any sense. It says the opposite. It says everything makes sense. And, and, and that's why we believe in God, because there's an answer to everything. God And God knows what that answer is. But the dogma is not, as I say in the book, it's not a wall shutting off further thought. It's, what it's saying is that the, the horizon, the vistas opened up by the mysteries of faith are so vast that the horizon, so to speak, is so far away that our finite minds cannot understand everything. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we can't understand everything because, because religion puts up a wall and says, don't look behind this. It's saying you're not going to understand everything because there's so much to understand. It's the, the vistas are so vast that our, our minds will never completely exhaust the truth. So that's why you say the reason that there are mysteries is that God is infinite and our intellects are finite. Exactly. Right. You also you talk about something called, what, fideism, fideism? Fide, fide, fideism. Fideism. Right. What is that and why did you pr decide to bring that up? Well, again, that's a misconception. Many people uh, who are atheists think that religious people have no rational basis for what they believe. They just believe because they decide to believe for no good reason. And, 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 and they say, oh, it's, it's a leap of faith. Uh, uh, the First Vatican Council uh, condemned that view. Mm -hmm. It said that religion is not just a blind leap of faith, a blind impulse of the mind to believe for no good reason, but that there are, there's a rational f basis for what, the things that we believe. Not that what we believe, everything can be demonstrated mm -hmm. like a mathematical theorem, but that we have good reasons for being Christians, good reasons for being Catholics. It's not an arbitrary mm -hmm. decision. Mm -hmm. uh, so fideism, a lot of people, both non-religious and religious, say, well, I don't have to have a reason for believing what I do. I just want to believe. Mm -hmm. That's called fideism. Right, and some people seem to think because they believe it, that means somehow it's true. Right. But we mm -hmm. believe that there's evidence, uh, histor rational evidence, and, and that's why, you know, St. Thomas had his five proofs right. and so on. Right. Now, uh, near the end of this particular chapter, you talk about the, about the materialist is in a straitjacket of his own devising. Right. Outside. Well, it's a point that Chesterton made, actually, that, that uh, the Christian worldview is much broader. The, the materialist has a very narrow view of reality. He says everything is matter, everything is physical. And so he, in a way, he's not permitted to think about anything else. He's not permitted to take, into a, uh, uh, to take seriously the possibility that, there are, that, ma that man has a spiritual soul, or that there's a god, mm -hmm. or that there are angels. There's all sorts of things or any kind of spiritual reality, he, that's simply a forbidden thought to him because it goes against his fundamental principle. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, the, the Christian can think about anything. We can think about matter, we can think about spiritual reality. So mm -hmm. we have a, a broader worldview. And so, as I say, they're in an intellectual straitjacket. They're, more, they're dogmatic in a, in a, right. in a much neg neg in a negative sense. What struck me as interesting here on one level, maybe I'm misunderstanding, misinterpreting, but I would tend to think of this kind of, kind of denial of God is the raising up of man. But in a sense, you talk about the marginalization of man. Yes. I mean, on the one hand, uh, 
it, it cut, it, it's a, a funny paradox. On the one hand, science itself uh, shows the, the glorious powers that God gave man. It shows the power of human reason, and, and reason is one of those things that make us in the image of God. Mm -hmm. uh, so it shows the tremendous power of reason, and, and, and I think to some extent that makes many scientists puffed up with pride, mm -hmm. because they see what their minds are capable of accomplishing. At the same time, it, they, it leads some of them I should emphasize there are many religious scientists, but it leads some of them to the conclusion that we're nothing but, right. ma but machines. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, science illustrates the greatness of the human intellect. At, on the other hand, it leads some scientists to think that we're nothing but robots. Right, you have a quote from Bertrand Russell perfectly summed up man's place in the cosmos when he called him a quote unquote curious accident in a backwater. Right. That's right, so it, it, it both raises us up, but also <laughs> for some of them lowers right. us. Pulls uh, us down. Yeah. Now you also talk about that science has turned out to be involved uh, in a double revolution. What do you mean a double revolution? Well, I would say, I, I, I guess I was saying that, what, that uh, some, what people need to have is a double revolution. That is, I, a lot, I, th I think of atheism as a kind of uh, intellectual adolescence. That is, when we're, when we're adolescents, we start thinking cri uh, critically for the first time in our lives, most of us, and we start calling into question the things we were taught by our parents or by other authority figures. And then we, we have this uh, liberating, some people have this liberating experience of sort of throwing over all of the things they were taught as children and as simplistic, as simple-minded. Uh, but what they don't do, or what they should do, is then have another revolution in their thought. They should then go back and re-examine and say, well, wait a minute, some of these ideas that I learned as a child, mm -hmm. I may have learned them as a child, but they were not childish ideas, and give them a, another hearing and start to question their adolescent questioning, <laughs> if, if you will. And many people fail to do that. They, they question when they're adolescents, they then lose their faith, but then they don't go back when they're mm -hmm. mature and start re-examining these things. And isn't that just part sometimes of a, the normal kind of separation that a young person does from their parents, et cetera, so they can go right. out into the world on right. their own, right? right? I mean, so it's kind of a natural right. experience. Right, you don't want to be stuck it with, with, well, there's nothing wrong with having the child, faith right. of a child. Right. We all should have the faith of a child, but uh, we don't want to be intellectually stuck in childhood. Uh, we don't want to be intellectually stuck right. in adolescence. We have to sort of transcend the childhood, but also transcend our adolescence and have a mature faith. And sometimes, yeah, have to take on yeah. the faith that this, this is what I believe, not what my right. parents taught me to right. believe, and that's the, I don't really believe it, except that they right. told me to believe right. it. Right. Now, you, you talk elsewhere and hear about things like, obviously, design. We hear right. that right. intelligent design thrown right. around. But you have a line that says, does Darwin give design without design? Right. Well, this was an idea of uh, Richard Dawkins. Um, and he says that there are many things in the biological world, animals, plants, and so on, which look designed, but he argues that uh, Darwinian evolution explains why they look designed even though they aren't. I, I, I don't want to get into mm. to that, uh, that. That's a whole uh, uh, complicated discussion. I, I think the strongest argument for design is not from biology, it's from physics. Um, the more scientists, this is one of the things I talk about in my book at great length, the more physicists have sort of delved deeper and deeper into the workings of the physical world, the more they've realized that the laws of physics are incredibly sophisticated, subtle, uh, profound mathematical ideas. Uh, the world is, is not just built of some sort of mindless stuff. The world is constructed uh, on the basis of very deep uh, mathematical ideas. Mm -hmm. And so that raises the question, uh, whose ideas? Mm -hmm. there, there was a famous physicist of the 20th century named Sir James Jeans, and he said, the universe no longer looks like a great machine, but like a great thought. Mm -hmm. uh, now, there's nothing that, that, that Dawkins or any uh, Darwinian biologist can say about the, the deep structure of the laws of physics, because no physicists do not believe that the fundamental laws of physics evolve. They are what they are, they've always been what they've always been, and they have this magnificence of structure. The, to give an example, the, what many people f uh, suspect may be the ultimate laws of physics is so, what's sometimes called M-theory or superstring theory. The mathematics of that is so deep and, and sophisticated that even though hundreds of the world's most brilliant uh, physicists have been studying it since 1984, 
they still don't fully understand the mathematics of the theory. It, that's how, how uh, deep the ideas are upon which the physical world is built. So that's just a great mind conceived mm. of, those, <laughs> of those great ideas. You also, in chapter 19, in the section called The Issue, you say the question then is not merely what the place of man is in the physical world, but whether we are indeed just parts of the physical world. Right. The idea that's sort of getting stronger and stronger grip on people is that we're just machines. Mm -hmm. And they think that everything is sort of pointing that direction from neuroscience to computer science and so on. But there are two great discoveries in the 20th century that really cast doubt on that. Uh, one is quantum mechanics, and this is a, both of the ideas, by the way, are very difficult to mm. discuss. But uh, quantum mechanics, in the view of a number of great physicists, uh, s suggests that human, the human mind cannot be reduced to mere physics. In fact, one of the great uh, physicists of the 20th century, uh, Sir Rudolf Peierls, said, uh, the idea that you can explain everything about a human being, including his, his mind and his consciousness, is in, in terms of physics, is untenable. There's still something missing. That is, physics cannot completely explain the functioning of the human mind. Um, and another great a Nobel Prize winner named Eugene Wigner, another great 20th century physicist, said the same thing. He said, uh, quantum mechanics is inconsistent with materialism, mm -hmm. period. Um, the other great discovery was Gödel's theorem in mathematics, which has been argued by, again, eminent uh, mathematicians mm -hmm. uh, to suggest that the human mind is not just a, a computer program and not running. Mm -hmm. We're not, y there's not just some program in there. Mm -hmm. They'll never be able to create a, a, a computer program that can reproduce uh, the human intellect. Mm -hmm. There's more to us than that. Um, so Roger Penrose, for example, wrote a book on that. It, and it seems that Gödel himself uh, had right. the same view. Well, as you mentioned, there, there's just so much in here, and yeah. I mean, you can get a, a, an overview, but it goes right. deeper and deeper. <laughs> and there's some very interesting things point out about Galileo, which I'm sure some right. of our audience right. be interested in, but we're just out of time right. uh, because we do live in time. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you very Barr. Much. Great Thanks. to have you here. Dr. Stephen M. Barr, author of Modern Physics and Ancient Faith, published by the University of Notre Dame Press, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Check it out and check us out next time right here on EWTN's Book Live.